so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, this is the session on what should aid actors focus on to make data collection processes and tools more child friendly. Um, so we have with us four speakers um, who are going to talk to you about the programs that they're doing. We're going to go a little bit into how to make data collection uh, more child friendly, but then also how to make it safe and make sure that we're protecting data um, when we are collecting um, data from children. So first off, though, um, I'm going to um, tell you a little bit more about the session. So let me just get to my notes. Um, yeah, so um, I, my name is Linda Raftree and I'm the moderator today. Um, and as I mentioned, we have with us Shraddha Kulkani from Girl Effects India office and Saeed Limat from Save the Children's Norway office. Um, Andrew Young who's with the GovLab, GovLab at NYU. And then we also have Kristen Hope who is um, still attempting to join but should be on in a minute. Um, so why am I moderating today? Um, I've had the pleasure of working, I think, with everyone um, on the panel or with, with their organization in the past. Um, and there's a real wealth of knowledge among everyone. Um, so I'm really excited to hear more in depth about the different programs. Um, my own background is um, that I started off in kind of post-war El Salvador many, many years ago working with NGOs to advocate for peace accords compliance after the civil war in El Salvador. Um, and then I moved over to work with PLAN in El Salvador and focused quite a lot on child participation and child protection and the use of media to enhance um, child-led and child-focused advocacy. So did a lot of work with youth and um, participatory media back in the day. Um, then I moved over to the US and worked on youth engagement, transparency and accountability, ICT for development. Uh, and then about seven years up to go and moved out to become a consultant. And so my focus now is really on technology and development ethics um, in humanitarian spaces with when we're incorporating technology into our work and looking at digital safeguarding. Um, and then a lot of research as well, kind of around the anthropology of, of technology. So I feel like this session really brings together a lot of those different angles that, um, that I've worked on in the past, which is why I'm excited to hear from our different panelists. Um, and also really well-rounded um, way of thinking about incorporating and engaging um, child and youth participation into, into our work. So um, a few bits of housekeeping. Um, if you have questions for panelists, if you can use the Q&A function. Um, and then in the chat, feel free to introduce yourselves, feel free to have conversations there. Um, make sure that you use the everyone and panelists option if you're using the chat function. Um, and then if you want to see both the screens and the slides and the speakers, which I think makes it more interesting, and you want to click on, on full screen and, and make your, um, your view full screen so then you can see the person who's speaking as well as the slides. So we're going to go ahead and get started and hear from our four panelists. But first, I wanted them to just quickly do a round of introduction. So maybe we can start with you, Shradha. Do you want to just tell us who you are and, and where you come from, why you're here, I guess? Sure. Thanks so much, Linda. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure being here today. Uh, uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm based in Mumbai. I work with Girl Effect, and I've been working with Girl Effect for the past three years. Um, I run a program called TEGA, which stands for Technology Enabled Girl Ambassadors, and I'll be talking more about that uh, program with you today. Uh, before this, I've, I've, I've worked in development for about eight, eight odd years uh, with various government organizations and NGOs here in India, uh, primarily focusing on participatory uh, programs, participatory research methods, community development, uh, and democratic governance. Uh, and I'll stop there. And yeah, uh, looking forward to sharing more about Tega with you. Thank you, Shadha. Um, Kristen, can you tell us who you are, why you're here, where you're coming from? Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Kristen Hope, and I work with Terre des Hommes as Global Research Advocacy and Participation Advisor. I'm joining this call from London today. Um, and um, I've been working um, in the field of um, 
children's rights and uh, child protection for over a decade and particularly focusing on children's participation in, in research processes and in program, you know, in project cycle, program design, evaluation, etc. Um, and uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been coordinating an international um, collaborative initiative called COVID Under 19, um, which uh, I will be speaking a little bit more about as well today. And I'm really looking forward to this session and with all of these great panelists. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kristen and Saeed. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good evening. Good good morning. Uh, my name is Zaid Nemat. I'm the accountability advisor for Save the Children based in, in Oslo, Norway. Uh, I, I came up uh, from a background with um, uh, with accountability of a population uh, working in the humanitarian uh, responses and the humanitarian field. Uh, um, uh, from Middle East and, and like Northern Africa uh, regions. Um, uh, so I've been working and um, uh, promoting and enhancing accountability to Afghan population, and specifically to children uh, in our responses in the fields. Um, so I'm kind of uh, specialized more on, on child participation, child safeguarding uh, um, uh, approaches within uh, the humanitarian sector. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with, with all of you. Thanks so much, Saeed. And then last but not least, we have Andrew Young. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Young. I'm the Knowledge Director at the GovLab. We are an action research center based at New York University. Um, <clears throat> and sitting in uh, the United States on Tuesday, November 3rd, Election Day, I have to say I'm delighted to have 90 minutes to think and speak about other things that are not an election. Um, but I am a part of this conversation today because of our work around Responsible Data for Children, which is an initiative that we uh, have been working on for a few years now to support UNICEF and other child rights actors to think about uh, policies, procedures, and principles for a more responsible handling of data for and about children. Great, thank you. Um... Andrew for that. Um, so we're the way that we're going to structure the, the talks today is we'll hear from Shraddha and then we'll hear from Kristen and then Zaid and then Andrew. Um, if you have questions while the speakers are doing their presentations, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A. Um, and then we'll have quite a lot of time at the end for just kind of an open discussion. I have a bunch of questions um, for everyone about, about their work. And then I know um, those who are listening might also have questions. So we'll have a pretty, a pretty good space at the end for some conversation around all of these different topics. So please do feel free to um, comment you know, in the chat or to add your questions to the Q&A. As we, as we get going. Our first person who's gonna speak um, is Shraddha. So we're gonna hear about the Tega project that she's been working on. So over to you, Shraddha. Thank you, Linda. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, uh, I hope my screen is visible. All right. um, okay, great, thanks Linda. Uh, all right, great. Um, so uh, really happy to be presenting to all of you about uh, Tega today. Um, let me start by telling you a little bit about Girl Effect. Uh, Girl Effect is an international nonprofit. We work in around 20 countries uh, across Asia and Africa, uh, and we create content, uh, uh, media content, um, and youth brands that girls want, trust, and need. Um, and uh, this ranges from chatbots to webinar uh, to to web series and. Um, interactive audio content uh, and, and a host of different things, digital um, as well as uh, paper-based uh, content. Uh, and um, all, of, all of the content that we create is focused on topics of uh, sexual and reproductive health, education and employment readiness. Um, and uh, young people really love the content and the media that we create um, because all of it is it's fun and it's relatable. Uh, and a big reason for why it's so relatable is because everything that we do starts from the perspective of girls. Uh, and this is done uh, 
through our in-house research methodology, which is called TEGA, which I'll be telling, taking you through today and telling you more about, uh, and also through other workshops and, and um, uh, research that we do with young girls. So to tell you a little bit about TEGA, let me just sort of take you back six years uh, to when, when TEGA was born and why it was born. And it was born out of a very real internal uh, you know, need at Girl Effect, uh, because as we were creating these youth programs and, and youth brands, uh, we realized that traditional research methodologies weren't able to help us understand what girls were actually feeling and thinking and, and what they needed. Uh, in fact, more often than not, we couldn't even reach uh, adolescent girls because through traditional research methods, you generally end up only interviewing the head of the household. Uh, and so we realized that, um, you know, maybe maybe it should be adolescent girls uh, who who are who we should train up to be the researchers. Maybe they're the ones um, who can who can sort of help us get understand other girls better. And that's how Tega was was really born. Today, Tega is active in Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania, India, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and the U.S. Uh, and I work at uh, at the India. Uh, leg of, of Tega and I run the projects in India. Uh, and you can see what the Tega app looks like on, on the screen here. Uh, and so to tell you a little bit about the kind of open and honest conversations uh, that Tega is able to unlock. This is something that a respondent uh, said uh, in a recent, recent project that we did, which is focused on um, sexual and reproductive health. And after the entire interview was, was completed, this is what she told uh, the, the, the adolescent girl who was, uh, you know, who was a researcher, the Tega. Uh, she told her that earlier there were a few things I could not speak to anyone about, but after this interview, I shared everything with you, and so I feel I can share with my friends, uh, those who are my girlfriends, I can share with them and talk openly about these things. One should not hesitate about anything. Um, so a lot of the times topics like sexual and reproductive health and, you know, are sensitive and, and it's difficult for girls to um, talk about these things with anyone, uh, but that's the power of Tega. Girls are able to openly and honestly talk to Tegas as friends. Um, there's, there's less of the researcher, uh, inter interviewee uh, dynamic there and, and they're able to very honestly and openly speak to um, Tegas. Um, this this is what the data hub looks like. Uh, this is the online repository. So when the Tega uh, syncs her phone and syncs the interview, uh, all of the data sort of gets wiped out of her phone, and and we borrowed this feature from Snapchat, uh, and and then and then the videos um, and and the entire interview gets uploaded onto the data hub, which is where it is also organized, and and a level of analysis uh, can also be done. Uh, on the data hub itself. Translations happen on the data hub as well. And it's a very secure server um, that, that, uh, that, that has a lot of safety features, including a safety moderation feature. So if there is something sensitive that has been said by any of the respondents, that is sort of, um, uh, your translators are able to flag that and then we're able to send that to our um, safeguarding teams for moderation and, and, and to, see if there is any action to be taken. Um, what is Tega good at? Tega is good at uh, formative research, really great at uncovering a lot of, um, uh, you know, just, just a breadth of, of information and um, about girls' lives. Uh, it's also good for monitoring and evaluation, concept testing, program design, advocacy and campaigning. Um, this is just a quick snapshot to, to show you the kind of organizations we worked with in the past, but I'll move along quickly um, and talk to you a little bit about how we involve girls throughout the research pro process. So it's not just at the data collection stage that girls that that the Tega researchers are involved, uh, but we constantly endeavor to bring Tegas into the entire research project. Uh, and the way we do this is through little processes and, and tools that we've uh, incorporated within the overall methodology. And some of those are, um, there's Tega checks, uh, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about, uh, which is something that we do during the research design phase, uh, Tega talks during the data collection phase. And then uh, there are also processes during the analysis phase, as well as the research dissem dissemination phase. So we make sure that there is constant feedback 
uh, from the Tega researchers uh, throughout the research process. So just to tell you a little bit about Tega checks, um, no survey is finalized till uh, our, our Tega researchers feed back to us and tell us how the survey questions are and whether they're appropriate, uh, if, if some questions are missing, um, if the language uh, that we've uh, used is not appropriate. Um, so as soon as a survey is, is created by our in-house evidence team, it is sent to the TEGAs and the TEGAs tell us if, if, there's, if there's some short, shortcoming in, in the survey and, and there's something that we need to change uh, or revise. So uh, TEGAs are involved during this, this process and, and it's only after the TEGA has sort of certified uh, the survey that it is then um, sort of finalized and, and sent to them for data collection. Uh, another thing that is done is uh, what we call Tega Talks. Uh, Tega Talks is basically a short survey that is sent to the Tega researchers after data collection is concluded. And so the way these surveys are sent uh, is um, it's, it's sort of sent on the Tega researchers device and, and then she puts the survey on selfie mode and answers the questions herself. Uh, and so the kind of questions that we cover in Tega Talks include uh, questions around, you know, what they learned from the interviews, uh, what they picked up on in terms of nonverbal cues, uh, any challenges that they faced, anything that they would like us to improve in the future. And so they really feed back on how the entire data collection process was and, and what went well and didn't, well, didn't go well. And this, this helps us not only for that particular research project, but also for future uh, research projects. Um, there's also the validation workshop that we do. So no report is finalized till it is validated, till the findings are validated uh, by uh, the respondents. Uh, and this process is heavily led by the Tega researchers themselves. You can see the picture here. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tega researchers along with the respondents uh, doing some group work. And, and so Tegas facilitate this kind of group work uh, and they, and, and, and it's a process to really understand if the findings that have, we've uncovered um, are accurate, if there is any gap, um, and, and to validate the findings uh, with, with the respondents. Uh, and again, uh, at the end of a research project, uh, to close the loop, we always share back the research findings with the communities. Um, and this is again a process that is very much led by the Tegas. Uh, so you can see, uh, in the picture over here, this is a picture of uh, Tegas as well as some community members. Um, and, and this is basically to ensure that uh, Tega is ethical and it's not extractive. Um, and so the Tegas, the local partners, research participants all sort of come together to really understand what the findings were of, of the research that was conducted. And this also acts as a motivator for participants um, to, to, to take part in future research projects, but also for the Tegas who build their confidence and, uh, and, and for them to be, to, do, to be motivated to continue uh, to conduct these kind of research projects. Um, this is uh, just an example of a very recent study that we did. So uh, obviously uh, with, with, with the lockdown that came with COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic, uh, there wasn't a lot of on-ground face-to-face research that we, conduct, that we could conduct, but we still continued conducting research. And this time the Tegas turned the cameras on, on themselves and, uh, and sort of gave us a, a week by week view of how the pandemic was affecting their lives. So, so the Tega researchers kind of became the respondents. Um, and uh, this is just a really nice video of, of one of our Tegas uh, talking about uh, how everything that, 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 that she was sharing up until then, I think it was four weeks uh, since the project had started, uh, should be shared with other organizations. So I'll just play this as the last sort of end to the uh, presentation. मैं चाहूंगी कि आप ये चीजें और भी आगे ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस के साथ में और बाकी बड़े लेवल पे इन चीजों को शेयर करें क्योंकि अभी तक सब लोगों को लगता है कि बहुत ही स्मूथली सब कुछ चल रहा है और लॉकडाउन में जो है सारी चीजें सबको मिल रही हैं सबका बहुत ध्यान रखा जा रहा है लेकिन असल में ऐसा नहीं हुआ है और जो छोटे लोग थे शायद उन्होंने आवाज भी नहीं उठाई है इसके खिलाफ कि वो अपनी जिंदगी जी रहे हैं ठीक है काम निकाल रहे हैं और 
और जो सरकारें हैं या जो इस तरीके के लोग हैं वो बोल रहे हैं कि हमने ये कर दिया है वो कर दिया है तो इस तरीके की चीज़ें बहुत ही कम लेवल पे हुई हैं तो ये बात उन्हें जानना बहुत ही ज़रूरी है कि जो आप कर रहे हैं वो एक्चुअली में नहीं हो रहा है तो आप जा कर के उसे सुधारें उन चीज़ों को और और ज़्यादा जागरूकता फैलाएँ या जो आप और भी इनिशिएटिव ले सकते हैं वो लें ताकि लोग सुरक्षित रहें हमारा देश सुरक्षित रहे और आगे तरक्की कर सके आगे बढ़ सके तो मैं ये चाहूँगी कि आप जितना ज़्यादा इसे आगे शेयर कर सकते हैं जितनी नॉलेज जितनी भी चीज़ें अगर आपको लगता है कि वो चीज़ें जो हैं आगे हेल्प कर सकती हैं stop this here because i'm not sure if i've overshot on my time but uh, i i i feel this video really brings to life uh, what tega is all about and how much the program is really led by girls um, often uh, with the tega um, video diaries project uh, where the tega shared week by week uh, a week by week view of how the pandemic was affecting their lives they've also told us how we should use all of this information that we've uh, that they've been giving us um so yeah i think i'll conclude with that and happy to take any questions later on i'll stop my screen share now thanks so much radha um and that's really interesting um just kind of seeing how you've incorporated girls and in, and their opinions throughout that that full life cycle and and also i love that you're thinking about the safeguarding elements as well um so thanks so much for that um if anyone has questions for shradha please put them in the q and a box um and we're going to hand over to kristen uh, if you want to start sharing your screen kristen um and and go ahead with um with your presentation thank you so much um and actually my presentation will also pick up on a lot of things that um shrada mentioned as well um and so i think it's really interesting to see these like um parallels of processes and also then what we learn together as a kind of community of practice um so i'll share my screen um actually i'm going to share this because i'm going to kind of i haven't been able to embed links in the same way that um tried it is can you all see that is that good can you see my presentation um, if you want to make it full screen yep perfect yeah okay perfect so yeah so um and i'll set my timer as well just to make sure i don't go over time so um yeah i was going to speak to you about this um initiative called hashtag covid under 19 which is um a um a initiative that involves research and advocacy really trying to understand you know how children are experiencing the the current pandemic and also using a child uh participatory methodology and through this i'd like to ask some kind of critical questions about how we as practitioners understand child friendly and 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 what we do with with that concept when we are um you know trying to uphold as as we are in in Taliban and amongst our partners in covid under 19 a rights based approach to children's participation and research and advocacy work um so covid under 19 is a um it aims to create spaces for children across the globe to be meaningfully involved in discussions and decisions about the pandemic um and about the building the post pandemic world um and in order to do that we decided to launch um a global uh, survey to understand uh, children's perceptions of their um of their uh lives at the, the moment during the pandemic but also using a rights based lens um and then the the objective is to channel these perceptions and experiences to decision makers to duty bearers whether global national or more local level um and to create channels of communication between children and decision makers so that change can happen um for um for the lives of children um uh again um specifically responding to um the situation during the the covid pandemic but also within this broader framework of upholding children's rights more generally So these are the partners that are involved in the COVID under 19 initiative. Um we um we established them have been co coordinating it um and we have a lead academic partner at Queen's University Belfast, the Center for Children's Rights and also a lead UN partner the um Office of the Special Representative to the Secretary General of Violence Against Children Najat Mallam Jid. Um and but we also have a wide range of international um non-governmental organizations networks um national non-governmental organizations um academic institutions and youth led organizations as well so it's a very rich collaborative effort um that we've been involved in since april of this year um and um and what have we been doing um as i said we did um we have launched uh what what to our knowledge is the biggest uh 
the largest survey of children's experiences during COVID. Um, we uh, we co-created this survey with children. I'll speak a little bit more about that after. Um, and um, we the survey was disseminated in 28 languages, but also an easy read version for children with um, um, difficulties um, in, in um, learning um, or with different um, intellectual and cognitive competencies. Um, compared to other children um, and um, so the survey was online but we also um, ensured that uh, frontline practitioners such as social workers, psychologists working in uh, refugee camps or working in areas where children may not have access to, to the internet or working with children who may have disabilities or children who are in closed institutions like prisons or um, orphanages um, so we worked with those frontline practitioners to enable them to uh, administer the survey to those children so even even where children didn't have direct access to the internet, frontline practitioners were um, were able to um, to support children to to capture their experiences as well. Um, we also de de disseminated a shorter version of the survey um, with the UNICEF U Report poll um, as well. And um, essentially, we had. Um, uh, in excess of 26,000 responses through the full version of the survey and over 5,000 responses through the U report poll of children obviously aged under 18. Um, and um, and to, to our knowledge, it's the only survey that has been designed with children and also analyzed with children using a rights-based methodology. So along the principles of the indivisibility of children's rights, um, but also along the principles that we should be able to disaggregate data according to different um, uh, profiles of children of whether their age or their gender or their nationality um, in order to um, look at things like non-discrimination um, in children's experience of their rights. Um, and we've also given the breadth of the partners, we've been able to link in with other existing research projects, for example, the Global Kids Online Research Project, which is being led by the LSE um, and a number of other initiatives. Um, so just how have children been involved in COVID under 19 at the different phases? Just to take you through very rapidly, um, when we co-created the, the survey, we, we connected with 270 children from across 20 countries to really ask them, what would you like to ask children of your, your peers about their experiences during COVID? And, um, and, and we tried to integrate that within the rights-based methodology. Um, we also, of course, validated the language of the survey with children to make sure that we were asking things in the right way. Um, we then, um, throughout the summer, rolled out the survey, again, mostly online, but also with frontline practitioners to ensure that the, most, the hardest to reach children could also have their views um, considered. Um, and um, we've been currently running over the past couple of months a virtual skills camp where we've been working with a group of around 60 children um, uh, in order to really build their skills in data analysis and have them involved in the data analysis and meaning making and data interpretation process. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, and we will then be um, disseminating the results of the survey um, in, in November uh, and, um, and then really uh, trying to ensure that children who been who've been involved with us along this journey are also empowered to participate in advocacy whether at global level but also at national level as well um, I wanted to pause a little bit about uh, children's roles in the data interpretation process and explain a little bit about what we've done here um, so um, we in the context of these virtual camps that we've been running over the past couple of months, we have been training children in quantitative and qualitative data analysis and interpretation methodologies. And we've been doing this all online. So here is a screenshot uh, from one of the webinars that we ran um, with a colleague um, from uh, the IICRD, the International Institute of Children's Rights and Development in Canada. Um, and um, she was, uh, this is a, a screenshot of her um, do, uh, teaching children the methodology that we're going to use for qualitative data analysis in terms of clustering um, uh, quotes from children um, and in terms of um, identifying themes and grouping quotes um, from, from children that, um, that were uh, sourced from the qualitative aspects of the, the Life Under Coronavirus survey. So, so this was the, the, the kind of training uh, component to, that, um, to, to build children's skills to be able to analyze the qualitative data. And then we ran a series of workshops. Uh, for example, here we were using Google Jamboard and I can actually show you uh, what that looks like. Um, 
um, if you can still see, uh, just have a fast uh, kind of video of, of how that unfolds. Um, you know, we have a, again, who's speaking um, is a uh, Michelle, who's a colleague from Queen's University Belfast, who had, you know, perfected this methodology of the um, child rights-based um, um, uh, inquiry with children. Um, and, um, and so we had essentially what we did is, you know, once children were trained in the, the qualitative methodology, we gave children lists of quotes that we had sourced from the 26,000 responses of the survey, and we asked them to analyze, to, to analyze it, to group it, to identify themes, to identify, um, you know, emerging topics, and how would they frame it, and what, what words would they use to describe what they were reading from other children's experiences. And so we, um, again, this is just an example of using the Google Jamboard as we, we you know, we're encouraging children to, to kind of make meaning of that process. Um, so going back to my slides, um, and what did that look like at the end? It looked like this. It looked like a series of, um, you know, children of, of, of quotations of themes that emerged from children's eyes. Um, and, and what did this mean for children who participated? Um, as, as we finished that session and as we, as we had that Jamboard with, with children's groupings of the data, one of the, the young participants who's here, his name is Pratit, he said, I really feel like a co-researcher now. And I was so in encouraged by that. And I went back to him and I said, Pratit, uh, would you like to share with us a little bit more about how you feel um, and, and what this process has meant for you? And this is what he had to say. You might not be able to hear that actually because it's in my headphones. So let's see if you can hear that. Sorry, it's not coming through, Kristen. The research we're involved in is with regards to children. And uh, myself being with children, I'm interested to know how children are being affected because we've been talking about how the pandemic has been affecting the world, how the pandemic has been affecting uh, the people who have been, you know, a, a lot of kinds of people. But when it comes to children, there is a very imperial need to look into how the pandemic and all aspects of how the children have been affected by the pandemic, because a broad study is yet lacking and we're not talking about it. So it was really interesting for me to know how the children around me, how the children around the world are feeling about the pandemic. Firstly, and secondly, uh, myself being an aspiring researcher, uh, the 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 uh, skill camp has given me a wonderful opportunity to get to know how research is done and get involved with expert researchers as to how and working alongside them as to how the research is done, how it is classified, and how it is presented. So it's been really helpful for me. So um, that was uh, what Pratit um, agreed to share with us. Um, um, based on his experience. Um, and again, Pratit is just one of the 60 children that we're working with as co-researchers in this process. So just to finish up, I know I'm just coming up to my time now. Um, I just wanted to focus on some more uh, reflective, um, critical reflections about what, what this process has, has meant for some of us who've been involved in it. Um, and really in my perspective, when we take a rights-based uh, framing of research, it actually compels us to reconsider the power relationships in research as a form of knowledge production and dissemination. So my questions are, is child friendly enough? Is it enough to just be child friendly? Um, do we have to go further? Do we have to unpack adult centrism in terms of how meaning is made about the data that we collect? And what narratives are important and how are they used in, in order to empower certain groups? Um, I think there's a lot of questions um, that, that are raised when it comes to if we start to we shift our framing of research as, as a partnership with children, it allows us to start thinking about things like, well, children may be as well-placed as adult experts, as adult researchers, as adult academics, as people with PhDs. Children with lived experience of, of their, their environments may be as well-placed to make sense of their worlds as us. Um, and so how are we providing space for them? And again, I think that what, the, what um, Sharada presented and what Tega is doing is a really excellent example of this. But And I think that this is, um, there's power in order to make this more of the norm as opposed to the exception. Um, because as adult researchers, it's also our responsibility to be conveying what children feel is important to duty bearers. So obviously putting, you can put it into practice in multiple ways, um, but I think it really, you, the, again, reconsidering power relationships means that we have to think of children as part of the decision-making process. It's not just about 
tools. It's not just about you know methods or 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 or, or, or an app or a Jamboard or this or that. It's not about the tech. I think because I think we have the tech. I think it's about the process of decision making. Who's at the table when 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 the methods are considered when when the meaning is made um, and 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 what skills do they need to, to 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 do that and what and how is that relevant for their future lives in their own ambitions, their own career paths, their own visions of of what they want to be in the world. Um, and then the, the concluding thought is also obviously there's a lot of tech to to I think particularly in the pandemic we've been forced to consider um you know how how we can work remotely but obviously the digital divide is still a very very significant um factor that limits children's participation um which is why we also still need frontline practitioners to access those children so thank you so much we're launching our research in a few weeks time please follow us on social media and um and we look forward to hearing um from you thank you Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, it's really interesting your questions at the end, especially um, I was at the American Evaluation Conference last week and a lot of the different sessions were just about the nature of who decides who decides what is knowledge, who decides, you know, why do we have to quote unquote produce knowledge in order for it to become knowledge and the role that evaluators and outsiders kind of play in deciding what holds as evidence um, for evaluation and, and research. So I think a lot of the same questions um, were coming up for us as the questions that you've brought up in, in your, um, your presentation. So I really appreciated that. Um, so we're gonna go over to Zaid next um, and hear about work with accountability and feedback um, from children at Save the Children. Thank you. Uh, I will start by sharing my now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Mm -hmm. okay. How about now? No. There we go. Oh. Yep. Great. Cool. So, um, thank you, um, uh, Kristen and, and Shada. Like, I mean, this was really interesting for me as well. Uh, thank you for the the really exciting presentation. So, um, from from my point of view, I would like. To, to, to bring us back uh, maybe to to like to the bigger picture as I just Christine mentioned um, um, as as what we do as 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 an organizations and and uh, maybe to focus more on on the humanitarian side of our responses and why we we do uh, uh, should consider child uh, friendly uh, uh, tools materials but also the important is the concept and the approach itself. Uh, when we do uh, our activities uh, and uh, with with those children affected, um, I would like maybe to to talk more about um, the accountability to to those children uh, communities, the the one we work with them. Maybe just to start with, I I wanted to maybe define what is the, the accountability uh, itself um, by its, its its being the process of using the bar responsibly and and taking account uh, and maybe being more uh, held accountable uh, to different stakeholders, including those children um, who are affected by the exercises of, of such powers. Uh, and if we went a bit back to, to um, we, we, as I said, the children, um, in our uh, humanitarian responses and specific children's uh, participation, children safeguarding uh, are essential for us. Um, and it's all about giving them the opportunity uh, to ex express their views, having these uh, views, voices, and feedback and inputs um, seriously taken into account, and, and they to have uh, the opportunity to influence in, in decision making. Uh, what is also more, more important, and, and this is to, to, to highlight for them uh, um, to be protected and their voices to be protected, and from our side to do no harm and to ensure uh, that we behave responsibly um, following our principles uh, and commitments. 
Um, it is it is then from the willing involvement of, of children and, and any matter concerning uh, them directly or indirectly. Uh, uh, this includes children uh, of different ages, genders, and abilities, and um, uh, those uh, childrens um, uh, and and those like most affected uh, uh, societies and, and and places. So children rights uh, guide our ways of working and, and cut across the, the full um, um, spectrum of, of development and, and a humanitarian context. So and, and us and, and like for us and instead of the children, we often face um, 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 a challenge in, in being uh, coherent to, to, to child rights when, when collecting data. Um, um, where we and several children believe um, um, participation is not only an activity uh, uh, or one off event, but it's basically a, um, a core principle that inform our organizational behavior. So it's, it's a right uh, uh, to like for us to hear their voices, their inputs, uh, uh, their, for them to share their ex um, expression uh, and feedback to be heard and, and, and used um, uh, and considered where it's um, uh, our commitment to, to uphold, of course, their rights, uh, following the, the international human rights, uh, children rights um, uh, that has been addressed and, and, and opposed and by the United Nations and the other humanitarian organizations who do same activities in, in, in the fields. Uh, so it's really important to consider two, two main um, points here. One is, is the right, their right, uh, to share information is a system, of course, but it's not the end goal, uh, but it's a way to 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 support. Uh, a respectful, uh, trusting, and, and cooperative relationship between uh, Save the Children and, and us as a humanitarian organizations, and also with, with those children and communities um, to try uh, again to, to uphold their rights uh, to participate in, in, in decision making uh, process itself. Um, so we have many areas uh, where we um, um, consider. Uh, child uh, participation or, or basically we collect data from uh, children. So in order to consider providing a safe and accountable programming, um, um, we consider child and community engagement in, in, in all uh, stages uh, of designing, of course. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, can you see my slides? I think they're off they're offline again or off the screen mm, again. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. Quickly come back. You can see it now? Yeah, now it's good. Great. So, um, as I said, like we have um, um, many, or like we consider many um, um, uh, um, activities where we, we where we collect data from from children. Um, for instance, we we often register and and, and document children's uh, information and data. We conduct need assessment with those children and communities uh, in order to support us in, in designing uh, our activities and and, and so on. We often conduct consultations in place. We have in places feedback and reporting mechanisms where we um, um, encourage children and, and, and communities to uh, provide their inputs and, and um, to share their, their uh, feedback uh, on our activities in place to help us in, in providing more um, accountable, but also to pr provide more uh, quality in our programming and, and, and activities we, we, we do in, in the fields. Um, we have many channels in, in place, like um, uh, community and, and, and children meetings. We have hotlines, we have focus group discussions, feedback sessions, and, and we have many others uh, to use in, in, in our responses. 
uh, while we also evaluate and, and monitor our, our activities using different uh, tools and, and, and so on. So it's really important for us to consider um, um, maybe some of, of the, the most important uh, 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 important elements to, to consider in place where we share those information with 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 uh, children and communities. One of them is basically uh, their access to to information and and their uh, safeguarding when when we uh, need to collect their their the information from them. So um, for us, the, the information um, uh, is one of the essential parts where we uh, combine uh, uh, to ensure that we are providing an accountable programming to to, to children and communities. Uh, for them, the information is also aid. Uh, so they need to know who we are, what we do, why we want to collect information, uh, uh, what kind of uh, information we would collect and how we will use this, this information and data uh, we're, we're trying to collect. Um, to consider that we're providing an, a humanitarian um, um, a response is accountable and safe and respectful uh, uh, responses in, in the fields. Um, um, maybe I will leave like some of this information to Andrew. He's, he he will probably take us through uh, many of these procedures in, in place. But for us, um, it's really essential to consider uh, information sharing and, and communication with community to to ensure two-way communication channels when we um, uh, planning to collect any data from children. So they need to know why uh, it's their right to know why and, and what we are going to do with, with their uh, inputs and how we are going to use it. But also important to close the loop with them. So they're involved in, 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 in feeding back again to them uh, in evaluations and designings and so on. Um, and we have many child uh, participation tools and activities we do, we do in, in place to ensure this um, uh, happening. Maybe in, in, in my last minute, I would like to go with, with the basic requirements we, we actually do consider and set the children where we, uh, when we um, uh, collect any data. So um, we, um, we work uh, collectively with, with, with our colleagues and, and the responses internally and externally to ensure that we have a child-led networks uh, with different activities. We take a child-centered pers perspective, we ensure that the data collection process is also informative uh, uh, for children, as I said. So um, we need to remember that participation is, uh, and data collection is, is voluntary. Uh, they have the right to, to say no. Uh, uh, so it's really important for us to, to approach them and, and ask if they want to, to share and so on. Uh, to use friendly, inclusive, and age-appropriate methodologies uh, to do no harm during the data collection um, to recognize the limitation of, of the data. We don't need to collect more than, than what we need and uh, the data collection. But also impo importantly to, to, to recognize uh, that we are accountable to, to children when, when we collect uh, their data. So uh, I would leave the floor to, to, to my, my colleague, uh, Andrew. So um, then I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you have in mind. So uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Saeed. Um, I think the, the kind of flow of, of the presentations today couldn't have been any better than, <laughs> than what they are. So, um, Andrew, I know you're going to talk to us a little bit, uh, or maybe a lot, about uh, responsible data and ways that we can make sure we're not doing harm when we are involved in collecting data from children um, and with children and about children. So I will hand over to you now. Um, just remind people, if you do have questions or there's any any you know, topics of conversation you'd like to bring up um, after Andrew speaks, um, we'll have about almost a full 30 minutes for, for discussion. Um, so please drop any thoughts you have um, in the Q&A or just discussion topics. If you'd like to bring those up, you can put those in the chat as well. So over to you, Andrew. Great, thanks, Linda. And let's see if I can get my slides up here. There we go. Um, great. So. Uh, Again, wonderful to, to be here and have the chance to speak with all of you, although it is uh, a, a tough challenge to go after my three co-panelists here, but I'll try to keep us moving um, and eager to, to get into the Q&A as well. Uh, so let's see if I can advance this, there we go. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, my name's Andrew Young, I'm, I'm coming to you from the Gov Lab at New York University. 
uh, we're an action research center that examines, tests, and implements new ways to leverage data and collective intelligence to improve the way we govern and address uh, public problems and improve institutional decision making. Uh, the way that we tend to organize ourselves, as I said, is around collective intelligence on one side and then data, including uh, data collaboration, opening data, and then responsible handling of various types of data, including administrative data. Um, in different contexts and we work around the world and partner with institutions to actually determine how we can do this in a more uh, effective and legitimate manner. And one of our major initiatives in recent years has been a project with UNICEF called the Responsible Data for Children Initiative or RD4C. Um, and as it says here, it's really an effort to develop guidance tools and leadership to support the responsible handling of data for and about children. Um, the initial phase of the RD4C project um, involved a long kind of due diligence and desk research effort to really understand the current state of data responsibility policies and procedures uh, writ large, as well as with a specific child rights focus um, to better understanding what types of uh, codified policies and procedures are really driving activity in the space and where gaps might be. Um, and then also, conducting three field visits to UNICEF country offices in very different contexts to really understand how this kind of data responsibility, uh, data handling processes are actually working in practice. So uh, last year when travel and field visits were uh, a, a much more realistic kind of undertaking, uh, we went to three places, as I said, first uh, Romania to understand kind of the data handling uh, situation in a more middle income type of environment with a clear um, and relatively concrete data protection regime in place, in this case, GDPR. Uh, then second, we went to Kenya to, to uh, see what the con see how uh, data responsibility kind of manifests in a more uh, nexus environment where it's a large country office that has both uh, development and humanitarian staff and objectives. And then finally, uh, Afghanistan to understand uh, data responsibility practices in, in a more of an emergency environment with a large uh, country program, but also uh, no shortage of, of challenges and competing uh, issues on top of the uh, data responsibility one. So through these field visits, we got a chance to, uh, as I said, kind of take what we learn from our due diligence and desk research into the current policies and practices and actually see how they, they manifest in practice and really learn from the people who are handling data on a day-to-day -day basis in these environments, engaging with implementing partners, uh, uh, national and subnational government uh, collaborators and others to really get a sense of what the, um, the data footprint and data uh, kind of ecosystem looks like in these very different areas to inform our recommendations, tools, and, and, um, and findings. So a big part of this effort was actually to develop a, a, a toolkit that could support responsible handling of data for and about children. And we always uh, are careful to say that we are talking about tools, not technologies, in the sense that we develop things like uh, discussion guides, checklists, um, suggestions for ways to moderate a group uh, a meeting to really dig into the different questions and considerations around data responsibility, rather than something that is a technological tool that, that might not be um, of, of much use in, in different contexts. So one of the big ones that we developed and it's available, all everything I'm, I'm mentioning here is available at rd4c.org if you're interested in learning more. Um, one of the major elements that we focused on was developing this opportunity and risk diagnostic tool uh, to really take uh, what we call a data life cycle approach to the consideration of data responsibility and data protection issues. So recognizing that, uh, that uh, challenges that might arise at the collection stage are likely to be different than uh, different data responsibility considerations at, for example, the analysis stage or the eventual use of data stage, and really being able to tease out where those different opportunities and challenges lie across that data life cycle can really be helpful in identifying what those risks and opportunities are, including, uh, importantly, we always focus on that risk of missed use of data in addition to misuse of data. 
in the sense that if a, a child rights actor has potentially useful data sitting on a hard drive somewhere that isn't being actually used to improve children's lives, that's not a particularly uh, responsible use of data either. But one of the really useful things that we uh, found in our field visits and engagements with different um, actors in the in the data ecosystem in these in these different environments was conducting this data footprint analysis session where we would have uh, you know a few dozen folks in the room who work on different aspects of child rights and, and leverage data in different ways and really ask them to consider what a child's data footprint looks like over uh, the course of their early lives. So essentially starting from the, the question of, I just had a child, uh, where is the birth recorded on assuming that I had the, uh, that, uh, the child was born in a, in a healthcare provider of some kind, where is that first birth information recorded? What about the initial kind of uh, inoculations and, and early um, first year kind of uh, medical treatment? Then where does the data go whenever I first enroll my child in school? Uh, get these sub subsequent vaccines and the like. What if my child gets in trouble with the law? Where does that data go? Who has access to it? And what we quickly learn is on this whiteboard that is quickly populated with a number of different actors and data systems and institutions and ministries and agencies is that it is a crowded and complex environment and quite often even those who work very directly in it don't have a great sense of what that children that child footprint looks like in terms of of their uh, data life cycle and one of the ways that we try to think about this in terms of ways to ensure that that data footprint is handled responsibly is to really think about a child's data as an extension of the child. And once we have that kind of as a, as a guiding focus, it really helps to, um, to identify opportunities in this, in this ecosystem to potentially take some more responsible practices. So related to you of the complexity and the many, many different actors involved in, the child's, in a child data ecosystem in various environments, uh, another one of our tools that we, we really focus on is this decision provenance uh, concept. So really identifying across the data life cycle and across different activities involved in the use of data for about children, um, identifying the parties who are responsible, accountable, should be consulted or should be informed about various um, uh, activities across this life cycle. Because quite often it's not clear who is uh, who is carrying out certain tasks or activities, who is accountable for them, and that's not always the same thing, really teasing out the difference between uh, who's responsible for carrying out a certain task versus who ulti ultimately makes the decision and, uh, and, is, and is held to account depending on how uh, uh, that activity happens to play out. So really getting clarity across partners within and across organizations around how these decisions are being made, what that decision chain looks like, can be a, a, an important way to identify both gaps in the current space and opportunities to improve uh, responsible data handling. But likely the kind of central element uh, that came out of the RD4C phase one efforts was developing a set of RD4C principles that could guide uh, work in the space more generally. So we, uh, in the interest of having them be somewhat memorable, we went with the seven P's of uh, responsible data for children. Um, and these are all really premised on the notion that there are unique challenges and considerations involved in responsibly hand handling data for and about children, resulting from issues like uh, lack of agency in some, in, uh, some situations, uh, the level of development, especially for much younger children, uh, con concurrent risk factors that might be facing children, and especially data systems that often handle children's data uh, despite not being specifically and uniquely designed and deployed in a child-focused or child-friendly manner. So these principles are meant to really guide activities across the board as it relates to data handling for children. And first, no surprise and consistent with uh, the discussion that we've already had in this session, uh, our, our first uh, principle is uh, being participatory and really engaging with affected communities including children, their caregivers, community leaders, 
um, and other stakeholders that might have uh, important perspectives regarding the unique opportunities and challenges related to the use of data for and about children. And really uh, the participatory element is especially important in getting a context specific um, kind of understanding of, of what that situation is rather than having um, uh, folks who might not be well versed in, in the uh, unique context and considerations of a different of a particular environment making those types of decisions in a vacuum. Um, I think it's also important to note that participatory is the first principle in our in our list, but really it's a uh, it's also relevant across the other six uh, principles as well. In other words, finding ways to be participatory and engaging um, children, caregivers, and other stakeholders in these other processes can be a, a really important enabling condition as well. So the second principle is, is around being professionally accountable. And this is related to the decision provenance element, uh, but also uh, finding ways to standardize and codify good practice. Um, we often discuss how uh, principles, including these are the for c principles, only take you so far if there isn't some codified uh, practice, roles, responsibilities, and clear procedures for actually carrying them out. It's, uh, it's nice to have seven Ps, but if it's not somebody's job to actually uh, carry them out in practice, they're probably not going to take you very far. So really being professionally in accountable in terms of who is doing what and how this data responsibility is actually uh, working in practice is a, is a key consideration. Um, and this professionally accountable issue also stems to um, other considerations like how you manage internal access and define those roles and responsibilities as it relates to specific data systems as well. The next one uh, was already mentioned by Zaid in, in particular, this question of how we can be more proportional in how we uh, identify and collect data for and about children, making sure that data is relevant um, and the value is clear across its lifespan. Otherwise, the data should not be collected or should not be retained over time. Um, uh, one of the issues that we, we heard a lot in some of our uh, work around a citizen's assembly to better understand uh, public perceptions around data reuse in COVID-19, a project that we just launched over the summer around um, uh, the reuse of data for COVID-19 here in New York, a related issue, though not specifically focused on children, uh, that we heard was this idea that data should only be used if it is the most direct means to understand, uh, a, a to gain a particular insight or answer a particular question. So in other words, if a data set might be able to, to, uh, to surface an answer to a particular question, but there is a less intrusive, uh, less uh, uh, kind of personally identifiably uh, uh, a way to get that answer without getting into personally identifiable information or other potentially sensitive data streams, then that should be the approach that that um, that actor should take. So taking that more proportional approach, both to what types of data are being collected and used, but also how they are being uh, analyzed and retained over time is, is the next one. Then we get into protective of children's rights. And here we really think about issues around classifying information as it relates to uh, risk and sensitivity. Um, so a key consideration uh, across the data ecosystem, especially for children, is the mosaic effect as well. Um, so thinking about what types of data might be seemingly innocuous uh, on their own, but if they were made accessible or combined with other data streams that might exist, there might be uh, new opportunities to um, to create some type of insight or expose particular individuals or communities uh, due to that combination of various data sets in, in the mosaic effect. So being really conscious of risks and sensitivities of particular data sets, but also how those data sets might be combined with others that could be available is, is another important consideration. The next P is around uh, people-centric. And here we think about both individual and group level data risks. And I'll talk about group data a bit more um, in a moment. Uh, and really thinking about what are both um, the, the risks and opportunities facing a child who is represented in a data set, but also the groups uh, that they might belong to, and also really being conscious of what we call inferred data, uh, inferred personally identifiable information. So recognizing that there are unique 
questions and considerations that should be um, taken into account whenever data that is algorithmically driven or inferred in some way is used to make a decision about a, a child or an individual. So recognizing that there are additional duties of care whenever decisions are being made, especially as it relates to service provision based on inference rather than um, a, a clear and explicit uh, description of need. Next, kind of uh, as I've been mentioning across uh, this uh, uh, presentation, recognizing that harms, risks, and challenges exist on a life cycle. So being really conscious of that data life cycle that spans from uh, initial planning for a data project or system through the collection, storage, and processing, uh, sharing in some cases, analyzing and use of data, and really recognizing how different uh, risks manifest across that life cycle and how they could also accumulate over time. In other words, uh, risks that might be introduced at the collection stage might have further implications uh, later in the process. So really taking that life cycle approach to, to those issues. And then last, and in some ways most importantly, uh, the question of purpose-driven, uh, making sure that the work that we're doing uh, as it relates to children's data has a clear, um, a clear and well-defined purpose and that all activities are driving toward achieving that purpose rather than uh, potentially creating risks or generating new data that might not have a clear and immediate purpose or could be working toward more vague or speculative ends. So I mentioned very briefly our data assembly work, but I won't get into that in more detail, but I think that it's a, it's a useful way to think about um, engaging citizens in a more kind of citizens assembly approach to really understand their perceptions, risks, and challenges related to data use in different contexts. Um, and then just to mention briefly, the principles that I just discussed, we really think about those as a kind of organizing framework for other types of uh, policies and procedures. So we've seen um, UNICEF itself has developed some guidance around digital contact tracing and surveillance during COVID-19 using uh, these principles as a framework and as a, a guide for more concrete and specific practices and recommendations. Um, and similarly, uh, together with Linda and our uh, uh, governance of data working group, uh, we released some recommendations around how to identify risks and challenges related to group data for children, again, using the, the principles as a frame. So I will leave it there and eager to, to get into the Q&A. Thanks so much. Thanks so much um, to Andrew and to everyone else um, who shared all of those really rich insights uh, today on the on the panel. Um, we have about three questions that came in. And I guess while we're answering the questions, um, I wanted to just encourage any panelists or, or folks who are on the call, if you have resources or links that you want to drop into the chat, um, please do that. I, the Responsible Data for Children Initiative, um, you know, any other um, you know, kind of links and resources that people might be able to tap into to support them in their work, that would be great. Um, going over to the questions, not surprisingly, all three of the questions that came in so far are about how do you handle adults? Um, and so one of my favorite mentors said one time we were working um, at we were working at plan um, it took us many many years at, the, at one of the plan offices to um, get the board to agree to bring children onto the board um, they just had all these issues with having children in that decision making role and this mentor of mine always said it's not the children that you need to train to engage with adults they have to do it all the time it's the adults that you have to train to engage with children because um, adults aren't forced to, and there's that power dynamic that, that many of you spoke about. Um, so the questions that, that are in the chat, first is really, um, I'll read all three of them, and then maybe you can just kind of wave at me if you want to take a first stab at answering. Um, one is around, um, how do you avoid having parents answering on behalf of children? Um, and I think that's, that's one you know, kind of issue that some of you might see, others you might not see if you're working with children you know, kind of away from parents and adults, but how do you kind of make sure the adults are quiet so that the children can participate without feeling kind of surveilled or watched or you know, adults answering for them? Um, the second question is around um, how, do you, how do you kind of get the adults to feel comfortable with you working with their children? Um, in that community setting. Um, and then the third one is really around, you know, I think one of my favorite thorny topics is really around um, consent. So how do you, um, 
Do you have any recommendations or good practices or lessons learned about handling consent when you're engaging with youth or children who are underage um, and you require adult consent? Um, so um, would anyone like to take a stab at, at one, of those, one of those questions? Just kind of wave at me and, um, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, I think Shraddha and Kristen, you had already answered in the chat. I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on your comments in the chat. Um, Shraddha, if you want to talk about um, working with the adults in the community um, to kind of make them comfortable with, with um, the work you're doing. Sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, uh, definitely. Okay. When, especially when you're conducting research with, uh, with, with children under 18, uh, when you're conducting research on sensitive topics, um, it's it's definitely not easy. Which is why there are there are a lot of ways in which we try to reassure parents uh, that we're 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 going to make sure that the, their children's data is safe and and that you know the 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 details that they share with us, the information that they share with us will only be used in ways that they are comfortable with the children as well as the parents. And we do that in a number of ways. So one of the ways uh, that we do that is working with a local partner. Uh, so obviously Girl Effect is based in Mumbai, but we work, we tie up with organizations that are locally based in the places that we're conducting research in, because those, commu those, lo those local organizations have a lot of trust within the community. Uh, and so, so, so the community members, parents trust these, you know, um, re these organizations, they've been working in, in these spaces for years. Uh, and there's also a responsibility that, that the local organizations have to make sure that, um, you know, the community is comfortable with the kind of projects that are, that are being undertaken. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think, I think the 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 cultural context and and the fact that parents community members community leaders all need to be involved throughout the process is, is something that that we focus on quite a bit uh, because there are a lot of questions uh, especially because we we actually take photo and video and audio content um, and and there is a lot of you know concern uh, around around all of this um, we also spend a lot of time uh, with with the informed consent, with seeking consent, and make sure that um, parents are really comfortable with the kind of, uh, with, and they have all the all the information on the kind of questions that we're going to be asking, what we're going to do with the data, how we're going to store it, uh, and they also have contact numbers of uh, people within the organization if they if they want to reach out to us and uh, discontinue their participation, pull out. Uh, or, or you know, want us to delete their data? Then, then those options are all, uh, all given uh, to them. So our our consent process takes takes a fair bit of time, but it is definitely the most important process to sort of nail down in order to have uh, a, a smooth uh, research uh, process with with uh, with the respondents there. Thank you, Shraddha. Um, I wanted to kind of jump over to, to Zaid with this question around um, you know, maybe parents trying to influence what children might say or parents answering for children. Since you're working on accountability and feedback, I'm wondering if that might be something that you really have to think about in your work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, uh, it's a common thing actually, because basically if we if we analyzed all, all feedback and inputs we are receiving from, from community, uh, we will see that we have actually low percentage where where we get information from children themselves. So um, um, it's it's a common thing, and and, and I cannot echo more than than the team would have shared already. Uh, but it's also important for us to 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 recognize the the needs for those children to to access information. So what we do is basically we dig in and we try to find the most appropriate channels to reach those children. So, so we're like, we're trying to, we actually have many, many tools in place where it's more child-friendly uh, focused, where we kind of reach out uh, those children in, in specific and try to get their feedback and, and inputs uh, uh, directly. Of course, with the context of uh, uh, concerns uh, for, from their parents or like caregivers and so on. Um, um, because we believe that the, the children have the right to 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 provide their voices and, and feedback and, and so on, uh, but also that there is a possibility to reach out to them. Uh, as long as there is a possibility, we are uh, committed and responsible to find this 
the, the, the best solution and the methodology to, to reach out to them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, from my side, I'm also happy to, to share, like I'm trying to find the link, but we, we have a, a cam, kind of a list of, of, of uh, those uh, feedback um, uh, channels where we can uh, like simply or like easily adapt in any, in any field. Perfect. Um, maybe jump over to you, Kristen, if you have any thoughts on any of those three kind of core questions that have come in. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, consent is always something that, um, you know, we have to, um, you know, grapple with. And, and, the, and, and when I say grapple with, I, I mean it in that way, because it's also when we talk about, you know, informed consent for a child, that's, that's one thing, and that's legitimate. And then there's also informed consent for, for an adult. Um, and there's also power relationships within that, right? And so that's also where, where it starts to, you know, um, get when it gets real, it can easily get um, complicated. Um, and um, what we've done, I mean, the, the basic premise that we've gone on for COVID under 19 as, as an initiative, which has had children involved at different stages, is that consent is an ongoing process. It's not a one off thing. So we've actually had, if uh, even if I was, so we've through children who've been involved whether in designing the study or in the, in the, 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 the camps or even involved in social media, they've been, there's been a whole subgroup where the children have drafted a social media strategy and they want to develop content. Um, uh, each different phase has a specific consent piece around it. Um, and then some of that consent, you know, is around, especially when it, it comes in terms of social of children being active on social media, that also comes with the responsibility to provide them with information about actually the limitations of, um, of, uh, of content provided on social media. So we, we, we've conducted, you know, um, trainings about online safety, but also, you know, so for example, if we have, if we're working with children to create a video, con video content for one of our social media channels, they have consented to, um, to, to share that and their mentors have consented to share that. We're also working with organizations that know these children um, as well, but, um, but also we have to inform them, you know, part of the consent process is informing them that, um, you know, once content is available online, it can never actually be deleted. It's beyond the, the control of the individual person who's behind an Instagram or a Facebook or a Twitter account. Actually, that information online can, can end up somewhere that's beyond our control. So even though we, if you decide that you want us to remove some content that's been shared through the social media channels that, that we're managing, we can do that. But it might be that that information maintain, you know, stays online. So, so it's also part of that information process, part of that, you know, um, critical digital literacy skills that all children need to be informed about nowadays. Um, and, and that really underpins um, processes of, of consent. Um, and, um, and again, you know, for the survey, um, we had, we, we had children, um, uh, we had them, you know, click, you know, consent to participate. And for adults, we also had children identify if they had a supporting adult who was going to f help them fill the survey, like a social worker or um, a psychologist or something. And we actually had the adults also um, click a through a, a consent process as well um, to uphold the confidentiality of the respondents. But in parallel, we also have to uphold the, pr the principle of do no harm. So how what happens if, you know, a, 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 an issue um, like, um, uh, you know, a, an issue of mistreatment or harm or, or something comes up, how do we grapple with that? We worked very closely in one of our partners, Child Helpline International. So throughout the whole form, children were also provided with the information about where they could seek support if there was something that they wanted to report. Because, and again, these are things I think we, there's no, there's no magic bullet when we talk about informed consent and do no harm and, you know, upholding the child's right to be heard, but also, you know, um, ensuring that, you know, adequate support is provided and confidentiality. We all have to negotiate and grapple with these things and, and find solutions um, in each new situation. And these situations have been turned on their heads in the context of the pandemic as well. So, yeah. Speaking about um, you know, sort of platforms and you know, you're all using digital tools and, and different channels um, in your work, I wanted to ask you, Andrew, what are some of the things that organizations might want to be thinking about, um, let's say, if they're using WhatsApp as a platform to get feedback from children or if they're, you know, what kind of data is being collected on a phone when, when someone's using it for research um, and how do you kind of manage some of those aspects where it's not the consent for you as the organization, but you know that data might be going somewhere else that you have no control over. What are some ways that organizations can think about that or kind of mitigate some of those risks? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. And I think I would echo some of the points raised already about consent and informed consent more generally. And I think that one of the key issues really comes down to, to a level of data literacy and ensuring that people are using, uh, uh, working from the same understanding and using the same vocabulary as it relates to you know, where the data is, is going, um, who else has access, how it could be recontextualized, how long it will be retained, whether it could be reused for different reasons. All of these issues that, especially when you're dealing with platforms that are not you know, managed and administered by the, the person kind of collecting the data, that doesn't excuse kind of a, a, an upfront um, and informed conversation about the implications of, of using those platforms. So I think that that's, that's a really important element. Um, and I think the other issue that we see, you know, whether it's with these platforms or more generally, uh, a challenge around requiring consent in order to uh, in order to gain access to particular types of services. Um, so really making sure that uh, we're thinking about informed consent in the sense that informed with a level of data literacy and a, and a clear understanding and a shared vocabulary and meaningful consent. In other words, if I say no, that doesn't mean that I don't get the, the service that I, I have kind of been um, uh, seeking out. So I think having both of those elements uh, are kind of core to all data collection efforts, including uh, platform ones that might be, uh, you know, dealing with systems that aren't under the direct control of the, the um, data collector at hand. Super interesting. Has anyone else um, kind of faced those types of challenges with having to explain what, you know, not just the consent for for your own organization, but but the platform or the or the channel aspects of data? Shraddha? So um, the Tega researchers, they use, they have a smartphone, a Tega device, and, and we have a, uh, an app called the Tega app, uh, which is where we collect, uh, you know, all of the responses, the video, photo, audio responses. Um, and in, in certain communities where, where phones are not very common or where, you know, adolescents having phones are not very common or where there have been, there have been news uh, there's been news articles around, you know, how videos and photos have been misused. Um, there is definitely a level of uh, concern and uh, because we're conducting research using a device. Um, and so we've, I think we try to cover most of, most of the questions around that uh, in our consent, informed consent process. Uh, but we also try to make the respondents and the family members comfortable with the device. So if, if a respondent wants to just take a look at the device, she's able to do that. She's, you know, handed the device. She's able to kind of take a look at it and, and, and feel comfortable about it. Um, there's also um, options for us to uh, decide what kind of response the um, the respondent is comfortable with. So for example, if it's a video question, but the respondent doesn't want her video shown, then, then the Tega researcher is trained to not take a video. So she just takes a video of like, of, of the floor or, you know, of the ceiling uh, and just takes an audio recording. So basically, I think, I think what Kristen said is, is very true. Consent is an ongoing process. Just because somebody has consented at the beginning, uh, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, they will have to now go through uh, the entire research or data collection in the way uh, that it is planned. Uh, so people are allowed to drop out, say they're not comfortable with certain questions, um, and uh, switch to other uh, kinds of responses um and yeah i think i think just being very open about about the technology that we're using and and um being very open about how we're using the data uh, and just taking them along along the journey is is important can can i bounce off that as well yeah, just please that I think that also is so important, as you say, and I think when we, when we have those conversations with children about data and privacy in the context of, of 
our tools or approaches or methods. It's also a gateway, I think, to educate children about data protection in general for children who are engaging online with a variety of platforms, you know, the big, the big, the big ones, um, Snapchat, you know, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and so there's, it's really, I think, an opportunity to bring up that level of, of critical digital literacy for children that is, you know, essential for, for children um, growing up in the 21st century. But also, I think it has to be conversation because I, I put a link in the chat box um, around some research done by the LSE about actually um, uh, understanding how children who are, as digital natives understand privacy in, and the differences that children have when they've grown up online and understanding privacy from a non you know digitally native generation like 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 us here on the call um, and and there are differences in what how children understand privacy and so I think that as much as we can try to you know provide guidance and tools and resources about online safety and critical digital literacy. I also think that they need to teach us as well. And that's also where it comes to shift that power relationship is how much do we learn from children about their experiences and how much do we also enable peer support across children because they might be better to teach each other. And, and, and I feel that we have a key role to enable those channels of communication as well. Um, maybe like uh, I really agree with with uh, with the with the points, uh, uh, and of course, like I echo what what Christian just mentioned. Um, but it's also like uh, for us, we 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 also considered that there are also other part of the world that they don't really have digital tools at all. They don't use network. They don't have any kind of uh, mobile or smartphones and, and places. And here, where like we we come also, I, I agree with Christian where we. Uh, need to build a two-way communication channels with with those people, whether it's it's face to face or like discussions or talk to them, uh, and to get like their agreement and their trust, of course, uh, to to maintain this kind of strong relationships because we need their relationship. We need the children uh, understanding. We need them to to know what we are uh, planning to do and so on, so they can participate and and then they can engage in, in decision making and data collection itself. Um, but so I, one of the good practice that we, we, we used to do is, is basically uh, uh, build the two-way communications where we share information, where we present uh, uh, and find the, the most at least uh, preferable way to share information with those citizens and, 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 and empower them so they know uh, and, and then we expect to receive their inputs and feedback and so on. So it's, it's really, uh, um, it's really a kind of... Um, good uh, practice to, to use where we where, where we work in and in, in places like uh, uh, Syria or Yemen and so on mm -hmm. or like Africa where children and communities they 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 may, might even they don't know who we are or like what we do and and, and what why we need to collect that hour and this is where we have also responsibilities as, as Christian mentioned to 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 raise their awareness uh, so they know uh, what what we do and, and, and that's it Thanks. Um, thank you all. We're at time, so I'm going to have to close out. There are some resources in the chat if people want to quickly kind of click on those and uh, get them before the session closes. Um, I just want to thank Kristen, Zaid, Shraddha, Andrew, and the organizers of the Géange um, for bringing this topic in. I think it's really important. And I think um, all of the different types of approaches that we use with children also usually work with adults. And so I think um, it's, it's really useful to hear how to be engaging and participatory in research. So thanks very much and hopefully um, be in touch and um, following all of your work as we go into the future. Thanks so much.